Hello everyone and welcome to another episode of the Rowing Chat podcast. We are trying to be the network of podcasts for the sport of rowing. We've been going since 2013. This is the Anchor Show and in it I interview a guest who comes to tell me about their background in rowing and the bit of the sport that they enjoy hanging out in. Now, you can subscribe at our website, rowing.chat, and there's a newsletter there that automatically sends you links to each episode we've published. That's nothing, nothing more than that. Um, we've also got the usual social media channels. Now, the podcast show is supported by the Rowing Directory. We're trying to build a kind of yellow pages for the sport of rowing. If you go to rowing.chat, at the top of the page on the menu is the word directory. And in there, you will find a page with 16 separate categories of different things that you can get on the website, from shoes to boats to rowing holidays to coaching to accessories, gifts, you name it, it's all there. I would love if you would tell me about rowing businesses who you know who aren't already listed because there are so many of them and we will put them up on the um, listings website. Our recent re listings include Pontoon who make custom crew uniforms, Rowing Vinyl who make self-adhesive boat names and numbers, Pinot Boatworks who sell moderately priced boats with the speed and feel of elite boats. Nelson Kellerman, who make rowing electronics for Cox amplification, speed measurement and force. G-Clip Row, custom quick release rowing shoes. Rose and All, the rowing data analysis website. Rowing Solutions, who sell electric coaching boats on our catamaran design. Sculler, who make GPS rowing computers that were used in the boat race, and Rubini Jewelers, whose range includes a whole load of rowing-related jewellery. Now, I'm Rebecca Caro, and I'm very much looking forward to introducing my guest today, who is Camilla Hadland. Welcome. Hi, Rebecca. Good to be here. Now, to many people... They won't know your face. So tell them why they won't know your face. Yes, it's one of these uh, careers where we're certainly, you know, more heard than seen. And so I'm a commentator for mostly world rowing. Uh, I do quite a lot of the, the British rowing circuit as well, Scottish rowing. So, yeah, uh, a, a voice above the racing is, is maybe where you might have heard me before. Now, you didn't start here. So tell us a little bit about how you got introduced to rowing as a sport and what you've done in it. Well, uh, I guess much like most rowers, I found the sport from, well, partially by accident, but I wasn't very sporty at all. Um, I found it through um, a programme that British Rowing at the time, the ARA here in the UK, uh, put on after the 2004 Olympic Games, uh, which was called Project Awesome. And it was about getting state school children into, into a different sport, into rowing where perhaps they didn't have access before. And so I went to my local um, mixed state school. I was really not very sporty at all. Um, couldn't, can't throw, can't catch can't run so it was pretty useless um, until I had a friend who had been part of this Project Awesome um, scheme in the year before I'd moved to the high school she'd kind of tapped me on the shoulder and gone hey this is good fun you should give it a go um, and yeah I, I just sort of um, went along once a week to sit on the ergo and found myself to be fairly okay at it where I had not been very good at sports before and as you do, you sort of get hooked and kept asking my parents to take me down, you know, every week and eventually got onto the water and yeah, rode as a junior at um, my club, which was Stratford upon Avon Boat Club uh, on the water and uh, yeah, sort of went from there. And you obviously carried on after school because you, you're, you're a bit older than school age now. <laughs> Yeah, I um, was lucky enough to be selected for the Junior World Championships when I was at school. Um, so I had the amazing experience of being part of the first Junior Women's Eight that Great Britain um, had 
winning a, a gold medal at the World Championships, which was incredible. Um, and that sort of platformed me to springboard on to doing uh, university rowing. And so I went off to Durham, um, which was very much influenced by uh, my interest in rowing, I must say, rather than my my keen interest in academics. But uh, yeah, I, I sort of did um, university rowing, went on to um, be president of the boat club. And so I was always really keenly involved in not just the rowing side, but the volunteering side as well and, and organising racing and coaching. Um, I did do a bit of coaching for a year after I left university. I ran the Freshers programme at Durham. Um, and then once I left university, I sort of had a bit of a break um, from the rowing side of the sport. I didn't make the under 23s and I had that little bit of a sort of not bitter taste in my mouth, but I was like, right, I'm just going to park it and refine it when it's right for me and um that's when i sort of fell into picking up commentary which yeah that was uh almost a, a nice little fateful twist that it ended up that way now i first heard you when you were announced as the winner of a competition now this was being run by the world rowing federation wasn't it can, can you remember why did they suddenly decide they needed more commentators and a competition um, was a great way to find them. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, I kind of found out retrospectively, I guess, a lot about the competition because on the face of it, I just was sort of encouraged to apply. Um, but the sort of background to it was that there was a pool of commentators that World Rowing use. And within that, I, I think there was one particular year where one of the commentators had um, had a baby. And so, you know, there was a sort of gap in the team from that respect. And um, just a lot of sort of colliding factors meant that the, there was uh, there was an opportunity to invite more people to apply to be part of the team. And so the competition, I think, was a concoction of the production team and World Rowing who kind of went, well, what's the best way that we can find new voices? Actually, you know, let's put out a competition and, and see what people can produce. So I think it was the first time they'd run anything like this. Mm -hmm. um, so it was a bit of a, a venture into the dark for them. And um, yeah, I was kind of encouraged to apply off the basis that I knew somebody who knew that this was coming up. Um, and so I got in touch with World Rowing and said, hi, I hear there might be some commentary opportunities. And they said, oh, hold your horses. You know, you might want to just have a quick look at what's coming out in the next couple of weeks and and um, just keep your eyes on the website. So, yeah, that's how I ended up sort of um, finding out about that. Um, and so yeah, the let's tell the listeners a little bit about the structure of the competition because all very well saying we've got a commentary competition and trust me this wasn't like a horse race where you had a, a, a shout off or anything can you explain how they set it up and what you had to do to enter do you know that would have been quite interesting wouldn't it head to head of like a um like rap battles wouldn't it sort of commentary battles not sure i would be uh terribly up for that but um no it, it was um what they laid out for us was um two submissions that we had to make which were recordings um so it was so the competition was held in 2018 um so they used the previous year's world championships um so the 2017 worlds in sarasota as their pool to pick the clips from for us to commentate on uh, and so they chose these two races and they gave us the links um to sort of look at and commentate over the top of of two very very different races so the first race was the women's eights final which was a very close race. but Ah, oh, sensational race, you know, the whole field within half a length of one another, the whole way down the course, changing leads. Um, it, it was just a really pacey, a, a really intricate race to commentate on. And I guess it was testing skills of how to cope with changing leads, lots of names, you know, big variety of um, sort of styles within the eights race and just that close contest and being able to describe differently and accurately but also build tension and, and build the kind of um, momentum because you know as you kind of come to learn in commentary you can't just go off the start screaming because then you've got nowhere to go <laughs> um, but so that that was kind of I say straightforward it's still really difficult actually and, and that's something that when I look back it was so difficult to commentate on a race where a, you weren't there so 
difficult to talk about the surrounding factors and the conditions and all of those things that you can put, sort of fall back on and build atmosphere with but also just uh, I guess a race that you know what happens and so it it, it, it was it really it was quite difficult to sort of peel back my memories and what I knew about what was to come and to make it sound like it was a real time sort of flowing piece um, that would be done live. Um, so yeah, that, that was challenging in itself, even though the race was fairly straightforward. And then the second race that they gave us was at the opposite end of the scale in that it was fairly drawn out. It was a lightweight men's singles. I want to say it was like a, a CD semi-final or even like a, a D final or something like that. And it, so it was fairly strung out and there was a big variety of countries and um, there's also in the single skulls you're expected to you know obviously name each crew and so a big variety yeah. of sort of pronunciation challenges um, which is part of the reason they they laid that one out but uh, the big twist came in that there was a um, there was a capsize <laughs> during oh. this race at the, the halfway marker and it was how you dealt with something that was totally unexpected um, and how you comment on what has happened but sticking with the race when perhaps you know you don't have all the information available to you and something's chucked at you from you know uh chucked at you from the side and yeah it was um it was really again really tricky because I, I still sometimes don't know how to deal with those situations that that happen you know I I think back to um I was lucky enough to be commentating at the Lintz World Championships in 2019 and there was a situation there where one of the crews raced into the launch and that was totally you know how do you even talk about that and you know people asking questions about or well, who was in the wrong and how, how do you continue to talk about the race and what's gone on and it was a really tight race at the front of the field um so yeah th these situations do happen in real life so i guess it was a really good um race to use and uh, they certainly picked it well and tell me, how many times did you have to record it before you had one you were satisfied <laughs> enough to... I can imagine you getting really bored. Oh, hang on a minute. Go back to the beginning. I've said his name wrong. Or... Uh, and I, I think, you know, the sort of angelic part of me wanted to be like, no, one take, because that's how it would be in real life. And it would be perfect straight from the off. But um, you're absolutely right, Rebecca, in that it was multiple times. And I was really, really lucky to have. So I, I actually, um, when the competition came up, I, I dug out an email address from about five years prior for Peter O'Hanlon, who's the tower announcer for World Rowing. Um, yeah. He's been sort of commentating for a bit longer than I have and so when I was kind of putting my application forward I fired off this email to Pete and I was like you may not remember who I am um, I was on your team at the British Rowing Championships five years ago and you have no clue you know who I am or what I do but I would be really grateful of some advice and some tips and he was fantastic and I you know sent off a couple of clips to him and he you know gave me some really good feedback and so actually it it, it was I did record it multiple times, but every time I had more things to add in and a bit more feedback on my style. And that's something that I never really had before, because when you fall into these things, especially as a volunteer and you sort of do the circuit is you just keep turning up to stuff and somebody may give you some very, you know, constructive feedback that's, you know, a friend or someone that's tuning in a parent or an athlete, but to have that sort of formal feedback from somebody who's been doing the job for you know a number of years was something I'd never ever had before and so it was really well appreciated and the first time that I'd really experienced that and it kind of uh, uh, you know taking that on board I hope sort of gave me um a nice run into the competition and and I think was part of the reason why um the result was was positive yeah so well done you but tell me <laughs> what would you describe your commentary style as for rowing races that's a really good question, actually, because one of the things I always say makes a really good commentary team is actually variance in styles. And you, if you're, you know, uh, um, a very avid and keen rowing fan, and you listen to, 
you know, the world's own video commentary or the, ta- you know, the on-site commentary or the BBC commentators or whoever, everyone's so different. And I yeah. guess for me, um, I, I really, I like backstories of athletes. I really like talking about where mm. athletes have come from and their home clubs and, you know, what they do outside of rowing and, and weaving those stories in. Um, it's something I really enjoy. I really enjoy the research part of it as well, sitting down mm-hmm. the evening before and sort of pulling out any bits that I find from like the federation websites or from twitter or whatever um i i love doing that and I, and my style is maybe slightly different to someone like martin cross who again he loves that part of things as well but because he's sort of lived and breathed it for the last however many years mm-hmm. he knows everyone and so he really can sort of get into the guts of knowing exactly who's who and who's coaching who and who's moved where um whereas i'd say i guess my style is probably you know i have to go out and find a lot of that myself and then weave that into telling the story of the race that's in front of me. And then there are some commentators who, you know, barely do any prep at all. And that is genuinely not a bad thing because they just talk about the race that's in front of them. And there's no kind of, you know, distraction about who won silver at the end of 23s three years ago and is now racing the B final. And I think you need a balance of all of those people to make a team flow and work because if it was too over informative you'd be like oh, I've heard this stat four times now from right. four different commentators um but yeah I, I think you need a balance of everyone and I'd say I kind of sit in the middle somewhere I guess but um yeah probably more on the storytelling side than pure race description um I think anyway <laughs> so you will obviously know Robert Trahan Jones and he has I'm told the biggest spreadsheet ever where he keeps his own personal record of all sorts of things which he jealously guards or is that just a legend (laughs) <laughs> I do some so Robert and I um we were doing the whole basically the whole of the 2019 season together um so we were on every race between the Europeans and the world championships so we got very used to commentating with one another we got very used to sharing bits of information but I think yeah you do work hard for the bits of information that you get and I totally you know I totally appreciate that as a commentator and Robert is again so accurate and he knows so much about you know the clubs that athletes row for and and Robert's pronunciation sort of records as well he's absolutely brilliant at seeking out the right people to record a set of names for us to find out how we correctly pronounce uh athletes from Ooh. different countries um which is great and but it, like you say i think we all like to do our own little bits of separate research as well i'm by no means as organized as someone like robert <laughs> i keep a little green book that's like all handwritten sort of crossings out and you know it's a bit dogged but um i might start uh digitalizing that quite soon i don't know it's running out of space um but yeah <laughs> So you will obviously know at Henley Royal Regatta that they have a, a wiki where people, we, we upload information about all the different crews. Now, I am going to put my head over the parapet and say that was actually my idea. And I suggested it to Robert when we were both on the regatta radio team when they used to broadcast from a porter cabin in the car park behind Leander. And... I'm a little bit of a geek, as you probably know, and I know knew about wikis, and wikis are public places where anyone can edit and add information. And so we put we threw it open, and it was hilarious the first year because most of the people who were savvy enough to work out how to edit a wiki were school kids, and we got the. I most remember this. I remember, so I was on that first team in 2015 that they had what we called the Bible, right? They they put it out and it was every race, you know, one-on-one. You had box and box and you had all the crews and all the information at the bottom. It was those kind of bits that had been edited. And there were some races where it was like, ah, uh, you know, Tom Jones at three can fit six sausage rolls in his mouth. <laughs> and you get to the bottom and you'd be like, Oh, I'm not really sure. <laughs> not really sure that that was <laughs> His friend says. Yes. I know. You, you did have to sort of read it before you opened your mouth because otherwise, you, I mean, there was nothing deeply inappropriate, but there were some sort of very random bits of info there. 
Yes. I think that's probably like a, a motto, isn't it? Just generally with commentary, like read yeah. ahead and think before you say anything, which I've definitely learned over the, over the last few years. Very much so. so now you're officially part of the world rowing team. So what's it like? Tell, tell us, you know, the background stuff. What actually happens when you're part of, of a team? You presumably get on a plane around about the same time as all the athletes. But what happens after that? Yeah, um, I mean, it's been amazing being part of this team. And I feel like it sort of accelerated very quickly from sort of turning up to my first World Cup one um, in Belgrade in Serbia when I'd won the competition. And they kind of said, you know, this is it. And there's no guarantee of anything after this to where I am now, where my year this well my last 18 months has obviously been fairly quiet and most things have been virtual or from home but uh mm -hmm. you know presumably on the cards I've this year I've been I've already just been to Lucerne and I've just come back I'm in Spaudia um in two weeks time I'm down to do the Shanghai World Championships later on this year and so mm -hmm. it's been this sort of really crazy journey where I've, I've kind of living this double life with my office job in the city um, who I have to sort of beg for time away to jump on a plane like you say when all the athletes do a day or so before the racing but yeah I mean um, every event is really different for the commentators I guess and the setup's really different um, with every lake that we go to and so I think um, people maybe from the outside will listen to us and think that we're in like a big proper studio because the sound quality is always amazing. We have some really fantastic sound engineers and producers that put together the, the show that we, we run, but um, we could be in all sorts of places. So, you know, once you kind of land, you've got to sort of assess what the situation is because Again, if you've listened to World Rowing audio commentary, especially the stuff that we do on site, which is usually for the spectators, but now it, it's for everyone around the world who can't be there. Um, it, it varies a lot between static commentary, which is where we don't have any sort of road that goes up and down, side, uh, up and down the lake. It's often positions that are only accessible via a launch or water and you sort of get thrown out there and... and dumped at your with spot with some and sandwiches so, for lunch and, yeah. <laughs> you get, you, get your sandwich bag sent out and so that's actually that's kind of the deal at Lucerne really you know mm, is yeah. you get put on a spot at the thousand or at the 1500 and you get your two minutes and then you throw to the next person and so that you know we get that at a number of courses so Glasgow say for instance where the 2018 yeah. Europeans were you get sent out onto the timing hut um through all the in elements the and the just <laughs> in the middle of the lake and you just kind of have to be prepared for you know what the internet situation is like but you know there are times where you just kind of have to you know really back your prep because you could get there and there'd be you know no internet or there's the weather forecast means that you can't have your digital you know laptops or ipads or whatever else so you've just got your paper notes and so there's that side and then you know you get the other end which is a lot of new courses that are set up for you know an olympic games or they've been sort of built within modern history and so they've got a road that runs along down the the, the sort of outside of the course and that's sort of you know the gold standard i guess for us is that we get to follow a race from start to finish which is always nice um and again so we had that at Lintz and at Tokyo and it, you get put in a car and you sort of alternate races so Robert and I say for instance would be on odds and evens um, and so you you sort of pitch up at the course a couple of hours before racing starts get yourself settled make sure your prep's all in place assess you know where you are and what races you're on confer and cross over any notes that you want to and then you you get out there and you you do the day of of commentary and day of racing and then you sort of wrap up at the end um, talk about you know, some of the things that went really well, some of the things that perhaps were little blips along the way. Um, and we just sort of take it day by day. And some regattas are obviously only a couple of days long and others we get the whole week, you know, to to sort of build, keep building and, and moving on from the day before. So, yeah, it's um, every event is so different, which is fantastic. And it keeps us on our toes, certainly. Um, and I love going to new courses. I'm really looking forward to going to Sabaudi next week, actually, because it's the first time it's hosted an international rowing race. So um, yeah. I'm intrigued as to, to what our, you know, what our setup will be like and, and where we'll be. Yeah. 
I, I think you might be wrong about it being the first time, because I'm fairly sure that there were European champs back in the day before they had ah. the World Cup. Um, Sabadia is a well-known course. But um, mm -hmm. I, I will fact check that before, you know, we... <laughs> it might be its first World Cup, which oh, is definitely. what yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm fairly thinking sure that's of. Correct. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Now, I loved what you said about pronunciation, so I'm going to have to ask you, can you remember a real codswallop of a mispronounce that you managed to hear or do? Someone whose name is with too many syllables and you, you have a mouthful of, it feels like you're eating biscuits. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> trying to remember some of the ones you know you sort of there's the ones that come up every time that you look at and you go ah yes I remember how to say this from the time before so like um I'm thinking about so a few weeks ago I was doing the Europeans um and there's a, a guy in the Swiss double called um Roman Rossley and mm -hmm. his name has lots of vowels that are all kind of next to each other it's like o's and e's and i's um yeah. and it's missing a sort of umlaut on the on one of the o's and so you look at it on the the start list and it looks like it's Rowersley and um I got a message from Robert <laughs> and I was like I seem to remember there being something about this guy's name that I need to remember how to pronounce but I can't remember it so I'm just gonna go with it and then <laughs> Robert sends me a message going Rossley like Rosty Camilla Rossley like Rosty so uh yeah it, there's a few that um you do get kind of you know there's there's plenty of names that I, I actually I'm really terrible with languages Rebecca so um I was never a I was language fan at school that. <laughs> no, I'm really, I do not have a brain for languages at all. I don't speak anything other than English, which is really quite sad. And I, I you know, I'm um, kind of kicking myself now that I don't. But um, oh. it's made it really difficult, actually, to, yeah. to kind of, uh, well, in some ways, it's made it really difficult because I don't have a kind of secondary uh, bank of, you know, I guess, um, letter combinations and like you know tones to revert to but also it's made it somewhat quite fresh to approach each different kind of set of um languages and different name types because it means I can quite easily then just remember from language to language right I'm like oh you know well I'll make sure that my C's are pronounced as CHs in Slavic languages and that my um you know my uh, intonation is on the first syllable in Russian names and that kind of thing so you remember little bits about each language that I keep trying to add to every time I must say I've still not nailed the Chinese names at all um, and that's something that I think a lot of us are, are really trying to improve how we how we kind of learn we've got a big spreadsheet you know that was kindly kind of put together for us about pronunciations of um some of the kind of asian languages that you know again a lot of it is intent and tone uh, which we're yeah. just not used to as a, a as an english speaker um mm. so yeah it's challenging certainly but um getting there and with every year I keep thinking you know once I'm in the like Robert's position say for instance where I've been doing it for 20 years hopefully I'll remember all of this stuff. <laughs> so um, is, the, is the guide that you aim to pronounce someone's name as a native speaker of their language would say it? Yes, um, we try. We do try and ask the athletes in as many circumstances as we can. So back before COVID, um, a lot of us would bump into people in the boat park and get them to sort of record their names. And so to try and, you know, pronounce it as their friends and family would want to hear it if they were listening into our commentary. Right. And so um, that's how we'd kind of get access to that. But also there are some actually funnily enough the language that is most challenging or the nation that is most challenging I should say is actually the Americans quite often because a lot of the Americans have sort of historically either Italian or Polish or so like there's a lot of um, Polish surnames in the American um, team at the moment and they're all Americanized and so of we course. look at it on the start list <laughs> And yes. we go, do we think he wants to be called Kowalski or Kowalski or, you know, it, it's Some um, variant. and yeah. it's variable athlete to athlete. You know, it really depends on what they want. And often uh, right at the moment, it's really difficult for us to speak to them because we're quite separate in 
you know, we can't go to the boat park because of social distancing and ensuring that the COVID protocols are fo- followed. So, yeah, we're a little bit in the dark at the moment, especially with new athletes coming through. I'm having to rely quite a lot on people sending me messages on Twitter going. So I got one, you know, Irish names, for instance. I, I oh, yeah. thought I was quite good ish with Irish names and my whole team at my office job at work uh, they're all um Irish pretty much three of three of the yeah two of the four of us um and so (laughs) I was like oh I think I'm quite reasonable and then I got a message last weekend saying Camilla it's Dara Lynch not Dare Lynch and I was like that's right I'll remember that one forever (laughs) forever more yes (laughs) so yeah I get I get hooked up by there's a Scottish variant of the name Marie, which is spelled M-A-I-R-I-E, Myrie. Marie. It's not Myrie, I can tell you that, but I can't say it correctly. Yeah, it's very, luckily I lived, yeah, I lived in Edinburgh for three, four years. And so I did the Scottish Rowing Championships a number of times and have been very involved with the commentary there. So yeah, Marie is Barry in a lot of those MHs, A-I-E-R, yeah, and again, some of the sort of Gaelic names, I think you've just got to kind of learn, you've just got to learn what the letter combinations are and then use yeah. your common sense, really, haven't you? And if you get it wrong, I think, you know, I kind of learn to get it wrong now <laughs> and then learn and be told and then I won't get it wrong again, hopefully, right? So, yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> so, there must be funny moments that come up because of the unexpected nature of the job, which you've clarified to us. Can you bring to mind any that uh, are publishable for a, you know, a family audience? <laughs> um, so the clearest one that I always come back to with my funniest moment, I think, was what, actually really early on in my commentary career. Um, I was commentating at Henley Women's for the first time. And at Henley Women's, you commentate on the back of the launches um, and you you sort of stand at the back of the launch and you've got the two crews in front of you. And I had been given this slot on the finals day and I had recently graduated from Durham. Um, I got given Durham's final in the academic eight, which was fantastic. And it was loads of girls that I knew because they were all, you know, I, I'd been to university with them. I just, you know, I just left, so it was all. Everyone was very familiar, and so I was stood on the back of this launch, going, oh, "Aren't I really lucky to get this race and to see these guys? I, I hope um, win this race." Anyway, I, we got sort of down the track, and <laughs> I get sort of within the last three hundred meters, and it was so close, you know, the, within a few centimeters of one another, and. I blurted out like sort of 200 meters ago. I was like, and I really hope Durham win this race. <laughs> and I was just like, I really shouldn't have said that. I was like, I'm supposed to be very impartial. <laughs> and I remember coming back round on the launch and coming off and everyone was like, I, did you really want Durham to, you probably, I was like, oh, yeah, I maybe shouldn't have said that. And everyone's like, oh. <laughs> so that's the main one that I always go back to. That's like the main, like, oh. Did they win? They did win, luckily, <laughs> but I felt really bad because they were racing Nottingham and I had to apologise yeah. to some of the Nottingham. I was like, I'm really sorry. I've just left Durham. It was just a slip of the tongue. Like, well, I was just getting way. so excited for them. <laughs> but yeah, that's, um, that's the main one that really springs to mind. I had one when we were doing Regatta Radio after a few years of doing it, sitting on, standing on park benches down the regatta course, the stewards allowed the commentators to come into the enclosures. And one of the commentary positions was on the floating grandstand, which is very, very close to the finish line. And you go up to the first floor and I was standing there and I had round my neck a stopwatch, a walkie talkie radio, And the third thing, I can't remember what it was, a giant pair of headphones, substantially larger than the ones you're wearing now. And that's right. And a handheld microphone with, you know, the big fluffy boom on top. And so I'm standing respectfully away from the older members of the stewards who are watching the race from there. And it was early in the day and it wasn't a massively sort of important uh, race. It was probably early stages of something. And... You know, you're listening to your headphones and the previous commentator throws to you and you're supposed to be able to do the basically the run in. And it's substantially Mm -hmm. difficult to do because you're actually dead ahead. So it's quite hard to see who's leading. But anyway, I'm doing my best and I finish with and that's so and so across the line and now back to the studio. And I click it off 
and put down the microphone and the elderly gent standing beside me tells me, he says, my dear, I thought you were talking to me. <laughs> and did that go out all over <laughs> like the radio I waves? It off. <laughs> I was like, could you not tell that someone with a, a microphone and with all of the paraphernalia is talking, commentating a race? It was so I was a private commentator just for you. You know, that's what we provide here in the Stewart's enclosure. It's a private commentator just for you. Um, oh. so that was an amazing days, commentator in the photo. Sorry. One of these days I'll probably meet him. <laughs> yeah, meet him again. Hello. <laughs> oh. But yeah, it must have been amazing commentating in the floating grandstand when Regatta Radio was um was at its well, peak. It was a it was a great honour to do it. And you know, it was little, as you know, Robert did most of the scheduling. And as you say, it's if you get picked for finals day, you're like, oh, thank you so much. That's such a you know, is it it's a a wonderfully mm. subtle endorsement of your skills that you're trusted. But actually, finals day is really boring because I was sat down at Remington Farm on a, I think it was a, a tennis umpire's ladder. So it was a chair at the top of a, 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 a ladder, uh, a sort of you know, step ladder thing. And you sit there for ages or 20 minutes goes by between races. And it was early days of Twitter. And I would be following the results on Twitter. And people would walk past and ask me to tell them the results, which did pass the time. <laughs> It is, isn't it? I, I was exactly the same. I did so. I've been doing the YouTube um, commentary with that team now since its inception in 2015, and for the first time, I got asked to do finals day in 2019, and I was like, "Yes!" Like, oh, you know, can't go too big at the the Saturday night alumni drinks. I have to be in bed and ready to do my Sunday of commentary. And because of the way the scheduling is, like you say, it's every. 25 minutes there's a race I got two races and then it was like well it shifts up now oh, you've, you've done your two races <laughs> I was like oh quite a, quite a short day then really, isn't it but um yeah it's still it is very nice to sort of um like you say have that kind of small um further in your cap to have done a finals day it's really cool it's like Wimbledon I think they say if you umpire a Wimbledon final you only ever do it once mm. mm-hmm. yep now Looking to the future, Tokyo is on the cards. Are you booked to go there? <laughs> almost, almost, Rebecca. Now, we were, we were confirmed pretty much to go l- last year before the mm-hmm. cancellation. Um, we'd been invited. It's sort of a, you know, um, sort of long-ish process with... Um, accreditation being put forward and, yeah and accreditation yeah, yeah. and all of that kind of thing and then you know after getting the green light last year for my first olympic games um you know involved rather than as a spectator um i was so excited and then of course the writing was on the wall for what inevitably should and, and did happen um but yeah this year i'm very hopeful um we we're still kind of going through processes at the moment it, it's obviously still very unclear at the moment what the spectator kind of situation is going to be like at the games and you know I would not like to say you know I'm certainly going for for definite um, but based on last year and we you know we have sort of been asked if we're interested again this year um, yeah I'm fairly hopeful and certain um, don't want to say certain actually I'm fairly hopeful that I'll I'll be in Tokyo come the summer um, just sort of refining small details uh, at the moment but yeah very hopeful and once once I'm on that plane I will be able to get excited but uh, until then I'm just going to stay nice and optimistic but real. (laughs) So I, I would have said I look forward to seeing you there but obviously as a spectator we can't go Tell us a bit about your future. What have you got on the horizon for your commentary career for rowing? Oh, great question. I mean, I when I first got into the world rowing team in 2018, I kind of hoped that by Paris, you know, I could be in contention for commentating at an Olympic Games. But now I've sort of 
hopefully brought that forward a little bit it's yeah. it, it's really exciting because that was what where I kind of was aiming for right was to be in the mix to to be considered for that and even going to world championships which at Linz you know that was my first world championships that I'd, I'd been to and um that was amazing and so now looking to the future I I I would love to do the head of the Charles is something that I want to do in person. So I did the virtual head of the Charles last year um, from here in the UK. The guys um, in Boston did a magnificent job of setting it all up virtually and uh, commentary studios in our homes were incredible. And so for me, I think uh, maybe not this year because it clashes with the Shanghai World Championships, but right. next year perhaps or, or in another year, that's one of the events I really, really want to tick off my list as a commentator. Um, I also, I really enjoy doing the coastal stuff. Um, you know, don't get me wrong, I'm I'm very much a traditional fine boat rower. I've never stepped into a coastal boat in my life, um, but I kind of was thrown into the coastal rowing commentary back at the World Championships when they were on Vancouver Island in 2018 and to be given that opportunity and having never done the sport before, because it's a very different sport, right? It's got completely different tactics and a different style to it. I sort of pushed out on a on a boat and told to commentate on a 4K 20 minute race and go, okay, bring it to life and, and see what you can do. Um, but I've really enjoyed and, and I've also enjoyed the beach sprints kind of oh, format yes. that has developed alongside it, which has been amazing. And to be sort of part of the early doors team. So I, I was very, very fortunate to be able to go out to Shenzhen to do the first world rowing beach sprints championships. And, and that was really um, great to see everybody getting on board with a different format that our sport can take where everything can be seen from the beach and you can kind of get out and back and the races are less than two minutes well maybe not less than two minutes but it's very short and sharp um mm. very intense and quite dramatic and, and very sort of showbiz but um i'm really hoping that i get the opportunity to go to an event like that in when it's more developed and see its yeah. journey kind of through to potentially, you know, an Olympic Games. I know that's not now the case for Paris, but potentially, you know, LA, who knows? Um, it's It's been a really interesting thing to land in. Um, and I didn't think I would be saying that as a traditional, as I say, traditional 2K race fairing commentator, which is where my heart really does lie. And I, I do absolutely there's nothing I love more than watching side-by-side -side racing when it's really close, you know, much like it was at Lucerne last weekend. That was just amazing to be back and watching that live. But yeah, the coast stuff, I, I think there's definitely a future in that. And to do more sort of beach sprints commentary and, and coastal commentary is, um, yeah, something that I've, I've really enjoyed doing. So hopefully some more of that too. Now, I do have to ask the Lucerne question is, is the Jeffrey Page Memorial Gin Club still in existence? Well, I, I always see it on Facebook, actually, because, you know, I so I started my first year in Lucerne was 2019. You know, I was only very mm. recent onto the team and I'd heard everything about the memorial drinks, um, the gin club. Um, yeah. And I, I don't think it took place that year for some reason I can't remember why and so I had seen something on Facebook this year that it was the second or third year in a row that it hadn't gone ahead so mm. I've never been privy to them Rebecca but you know maybe one year um it uh yeah uh, I know that certainly it is still in existence in some capacity so just for people who don't know Jeffrey Page was the legendary rowing correspondent for the Times newspaper and he was, a, he and his wife were stalwarts of the rowing scene for years and years and years. And I met him when I was the press officer for the Women's Eight Head of the River Race. And he was absolutely delightful, but he was a serious drinker. And I think it was quite possibly Robert Trahan Jones and Chris Dodd who instigated it after he died, I think. And I, I have a slight suspicion that he maybe died just before Lucerne and they thought it would be quite nice to get that it was a journalist's get together really rather than the commentators one but I just mm. kind of feel that the two are now quite sort of morphed into one 
Yes, there are a lot of commentators that kind of dual hat. Well, Robert is one, right? He writes yeah. a lot for um, the Irish sort of journalistic yeah. spheres. And so he's kind of jumping off from a race with all of his notes on circled Irish crews and going, OK, I'm just going to go and get down a thousand words before I forget what's happened during the day and then I'll meet you at dinner. And so he sort of toddles off to his room and gets it all down. But yeah, I'm one of these people that I can't multitask. I'm just like focus on the commentary um maybe when I'm again more experienced then I can not have to spend hours kind of jotting down my notes and doing that kind of thing and I just sort of breeze into it and I know so much because I've been going to every event um maybe one day I, I might be able to multitask a bit more but uh, yeah there are quite a few people that do that so apart from your prodigious memory what are the tools of the trade do you have really expensive binoculars I got asked this question by Patricia Carswell, actually, what what my best um, tip is and what my best piece of equipment is to take with me to a rowing race. And surprisingly, I said my good, my really good backpack, because, uh, again, it's not anything that is helpful towards the commentary. It's not anything that kind of influences my commentating at all, but it, it certainly protects and is helpful for, like I mentioned earlier in the podcast, any situation I get thrown into, as long as my backpack, it has my laptop secure and all of my notes secure and it's waterproof and it all stays dry, then I know that I'm going to be able to do my job. And whether that's mm -hmm. stepping onto a launch with it securely on my back or, you know, I'm in a car or I'm being gotten sort of zip lining down to wherever you know we get put in some really weird situations never zip lining although I wouldn't be surprised if one day they said oh yeah you're actually up there and here's the zip line off you go um but yeah I just know that if I've got that and it's got all my little pockets in and all my charges it it's a it's just you know I started going to these events when I first started and I had my tote bag you know my my sort of over the shoulder with all my stuff crammed into it and I soon came to realize that that was not going to you know cut the mustard and uh, yeah investment in a good backpack was everything and I take it everywhere with me now with all of my sun cream changes of clothes waterproofs yeah. notes you name it and it does the job. <laughs> Fantastic. Camilla, it's been absolutely delightful having you on the Rowing Chat podcast with me. Now tell the listeners where they can connect with you online. Yeah, so I'm mostly on Twitter. That's where I do most of my sort of rowing musings, like I say. So if you've got any nice little facts you want to get in touch with about pronunciations, absolutely always keen to hear. Um, you can find me on Twitter at Camilla Hadland. Um, and yeah, that's mostly where you'll see. And I'm also on Instagram as well, where I put some nice photos and videos of the courses that I end up at so you can find me on there too. Fantastic it's been an absolute delight having you here with us on Rowing Chat thank you so very much and to our listeners please don't forget the Rowing Directory our sponsor and sign up to the newsletter or tell a friend if you think they would enjoy subscribing you can get the Rowing Chat podcast wherever you get your podcasts we're in all the apps till next time Bye-bye. Thanks, bye.